Welcome to another issue of Whiskey Politics, and we're also here with uh, the team at the Weekly Standard, and we have with us uh, this week, we are going to be visiting with Michael Graham. Michael Graham is a columnist at the Weekly Standard, is also a talk show host, and has been seen not only throughout the United States, but also, if I understand correctly, you are listened to in Ireland, or have been listened <laughs> to in Ireland over the years. I have this bizarre relationship with Ireland. A few years ago, I uh, started becoming a regular guest on the number one news talk station in Ireland. And now I'm re every Friday I'm on and they bring me over for live events. And here's what's so cool. Everyone in Ireland is either a liberal, a super liberal, or Nancy Pelosi. That's the whole thing. <laughs> and so basically I do freak show radio. I'm like, remember like the dog faced boy or the bearded lady? Right. That's me. I'm like carnival. It walks, it talks. It liked George W. Bush. It, the, you know, <laughs> it, it supports, you know, the Iraq war and tax cuts. Come see the crazed Republican conservative and people line up. And the best thing about the Irish is they love to debate. They love to argue but they don't want you to think that you're mad at them because they don't take it personally at all. It's, the, it's the wonderful. It really is. The left can learn so much in America from the left in Ireland. So when they figure out that they disagree with you on everything, they want to do two things immediately. Start yelling at you and give you alcohol. Well, <laughs> I'm a recovering radio talk show host and a wannabe alcoholic. So I'm in heaven. I like yelling and, bo and drinking are like my two favorite thing. There was another, I'm married. There was a third thing. I forget what it was. I liked, I can't remember something <laughs> squishy, but so yelling and boozing. So I, I, when I go to Ireland, I just wander into a pub and just casually mention, like, you, don't, you don't have to say like, you know, whatever, like you're a hard, all you do is like, you know, I'm not sure Donald Trump is in fact the dumbest person ever. And before you finish the sentence, there'll be four Irishmen shoving Guinness into your hand and yelling at you. It's, it's absolutely And, and you're wonderful. the only voice of conservative reason uh, on not, these shows. Well, I, there's not a lot. I, I don't know enough. I'm sh there's probably some other people. But uh, it certainly it reminds me, as, as loony as sometimes you think things are in the U.S., they are far loonier abroad. I mean, we right. there is, you know, for all the issues that some people have now with Fox News because they've kind of you know, made some changes about their presentation, there are alternative voices. As much as CNN is sometimes loathsome, and they are. My favorite example, the uh, horrible stabbing and car incident at Ohio State University. Two days later, the guy has on his Facebook page, I'm tired of how Muslims are being treated. I'm going to kill in the name of Allah. Literally, the Chiron on CNN. Authorities still seek motive in LSU. I mean, what do you mean? Seek what? Where, where is this? Where are you seeking? What is? What are you using? Like you know, Coletta, the psychic from the Virgin Islands on a one eight hundred number. <laughs> he put it on his Facebook page. But as bad as CNN is, they still have other voices. In European media, there are almost no other voices, and that's one reason why they have such a skewed vision of America, of our politics and really don't, really don't get the Donald Trump phenomenon. Well, it, that opens up another question for you, because obviously coming from, and if I remember correctly, it's Boston area, New England That's area, right. you had millions of listeners on talk mm -hmm. radio, uh, another bastion of liberalism. <laughs> yes, okay, absolutely. You seem to find yourself in these, in these zones of- <laughs> Yes, I do. Uh, so, so with that, however, messaging is one of the biggest topics that's come out of the election. In fact, we were looking for mea culpas from the media right after election right. day, and they just doubled down. That's right. And we, we're racists and homophobes and xenophobes, double down. Mm -hmm. um, from your perspective, as somebody that, I mean, you've been on Dr. Phil, you've been on uh, Bill O'Reilly, you've been on Bill, Bill Maher, Maher. Yeah. okay, real time with Bill <laughs> Maher. Um, how does that message now, obviously CNN is, are going mm -hmm. to be playing what they should have been playing with the presidency <laughs> of the last eight years as their job as an attack mm -hmm. dog media to, to find out if there's any... Uh, lack of transparency, any scandals or anything like that. They're going to be doing that for Trump. Mm -hmm. But how do we make sure that the message of conservatism, free markets, and that maybe Trump isn't as bad as they're saying? Well, I have, I have a little mess, a little point, and then a big point. The little point is, please, my fellow conservatives, don't continue the team play. Don't say, Trump is good and you know because he won, so he's our guy. And he's right. a Republican, so he's always right. No, no one's always right. Just stop it. I think one of the reasons why talk radio has really struggled the last 
you know, seven, eight, nine years. This isn't just Obama's victory, but just people are turned off by this notion you're going to turn on the radio and you know that whatever the guy on the host is going to be, Obama's wrong and my team's right. Team, team, team. You know, it's like Ohio State, Michigan fans, you know, Carolina Clemson fans. Right. I don't, no, no, no. I want, I don't, that's no fun. There's no fun in that conversation. So please don't, particularly those of us who were not particular fans of Mr. Trump. And by the way, thank you, Mr. Trump for giving me a room at my re-education camp with a window. That's all I asked. And I'm trying to, I, I sing along with the chant every morning and I hope I'm doing well. But just don't, please don't suddenly turn into, Trump is right, Trump is because he's Trump. Just, that's not a win. Yeah. Let, let the media do their job, blah, blah, blah. But the bigger message is learn the lesson of Trump. Who had the most fun running for president? Now, you know, that's a trick question because Hillary it, never has fun doing anything. You know, Hillary, it's hard to have joy in your heart when the only way you can stay alive is sucking the blood from live children into your lifeless body through some vampiric uh, you know, ceremony that you've taken through the dark arts. I know that. But I mean, go back. Go back to Marco Rubio, young guy, you know, good looking guy. Uh, 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 Rick Perry, you know, there were three reasons with Perry's having fun. He just can't remember the third one. Uh, you know, on and on. <laughs> There were initials. Donald Trump had more fun than anyone. He was having a good time. Right. And I wish that my fellow conservatives would learn the power of the good mood, the power of a smile, the power of hope and fun. Is Donald Trump borderline insane? Possibly. I, I, there's a case to be made. But he seems like he wants to do good things. He knows who he thinks the good guys are. He knows who the bad guys are. He's very good at picking enemies. He has the best taste in enemies of anybody that I know. He makes, yeah, absolutely. He makes all the right people <laughs> miserable. But he's, he's, he doesn't seem to be nearly as upset by everything as everyone else is. Why not learn that lesson? What's wrong with being in a good mood? Look, this is what I understand, too. As I grew up in an evangelical household. I... Uh, I, uh, uh, my parents sent me to Oral Roberts University and I, I majored in fundraising. So please laugh because if you don't, God's going to take me. And one of the lessons you learn right away in Christianity is we're all doomed anyway. I mean, really, you know, when you look at it, it's, we all end up dead and you're either going to heaven or hell. And you know, so the big picture is already taken care of. You know, right. there's, there's no exit. There is no escape plan. We're all doomed. And I always thought that was the reassuring part of conservatism is that it said, yeah, we know we're all doomed. The, we know, the train ends at the same station no matter what you do. How can you just make the trip more smart, better for the most people, and enjoyable? The left is lost because they think they can somehow magically make the train go somewhere else. They can go to Nirvana. And, you can, and, so, and they're willing to slaughter untold millions of people from the Soviet Union to you know, Vietnam to you know, Cuba to get to this magical, wonderful place where we're all happy. Right. We know we're doomed, so lighten up. You know, most, many, many uh, conservatives either believe, have a direct you know, uh, religious faith or they have a belief in some higher power or order that tends to be you know, part of the right. Relax. Let the order take care of the big stuff. Let's just take care of each other, love our families, make our communities better, tell some jokes, have a good time, and, and, and follow Trump's lead. Come on. So the messaging sometimes is dictated by time constraints and in mainstream mm -hmm. media and on your a radio show, sure. you have commercials and things like this. And what's evolved over the past 10 days, and a couple of nights ago, you and I were talking late about this. Is, he was drinking. Is I just want to get that on the record. He, Dave was absolutely drinking. Water. I, of course, being a, a dedicated fighter against the scourge of alcohol, tried to drink everything before he could get it as a, an attempt to help David help not, not become unsober. And, and I didn't have But anyway, so we were talking about what? what so, you? so you've evolved from being, you know, with millions of listeners on AM Talk Radio mm -hmm. into having a lot of listeners still on podcasts. Right. Mm -hmm. and, in, and for those, and we're at the Weekly Standard Cruise, which I think the average age is... Um, BC, something. No, but <laughs> hey, so, hey, so, hey. Podcast, so podcasting maybe. I'll put it this way. It's <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on the kind of cruise ship where when they say don't work blue, what they're talking about is the color of the hair of the ladies in the audience. That's, this also happens to be that. the ICU color. It's, it's well. very, 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 very nice. So, podcasting is great. Yeah. New media is great. Um, uh, I've, I've been a talk show host for, for a long time. I just a few months ago took over as creative director for the Weekly Standard. The right. Washington Examiner and Red Alert Politics, three uh, properties. I do videos to try to communicate with people, f targeting Facebook, Twitter, social media, mm -hmm. as well as explainer videos to, that are all two minutes or less. Because like you said, met, how do we put the message in a box that people who are under 40 are comfortable looking in and can get the message? Right. We do fun stuff. It is this great series at the Weekly Standard with some brilliant writers, Eric Felton and Dick Mattis. 
called Campaign Cocktails, where they dug up these recipes from back in the day, back in the you know, pre-TV days, I didn't know this, uh, campaigns used to invent cocktails for their candidates and the ingredients in the cocktail kind of told the story of who their candidate was. Like uh, wow. uh, William Henry Harrison, who died in 30 days, uh, was old hard cider because he was this tough general, whatever. And that was, he was kind of known. He grew up in the backwoods. And so you'd go to his events and have cider. There was a Teddy Roosevelt drink. There was a, a William Howard Taft drink. And so we recreated them and did this little video vignettes. It was a lot of fun. And so we do that. And then, of course, we do the podcast. We do a weekly podcast for Podcast One with Bill Crystal. We've got uh, the Confab with Eric Felton on the Washington Examiner side. David Drucker, a very smart political reporter, does a weekly examining politics podcast. And what podcasts let us do is put the content up immediately for the people who want to know today. Like, what, like every, for example, uh, at the week, Washington Examiner, we're doing the Trump transition report every afternoon, a short five to eight minute podcast hits at WashingtonExaminer.com. You listen to it, you know everyone who was appointed that day, any of the major you know, uh, conflicts, any rumors, it's all in a bite-sized uh, you know, a supply right there, bite-sized portion. But it's also, as you know, up for eternity. Right. And so it gives people a chance who maybe they're, yeah, all week you're working, the weekend comes around, maybe you're gonna do some yard work, you're gonna do, we can put lights on the Christmas tree, whatever. You can pop in your headphones, listen to some great conversations, like the wonderful Whiskey Politics podcast, or Bill Crystal at Podcast One, or the many other great Ricochet products, and they're right there. And I think that that idea that the media work for the consumer, that if you're not gonna give the consumer what they want and when they want it, which if you think about it, that's kind of like the basics. You know what I mean? I mean, if you open a pizza joint, what are the two questions you have for your model? Am I feeding people food they want and can they get it when they're hungry? The media have this attitude like, we do the news from eight to nine and you'll come to us and we're gonna talk about news stories that we think you ought to think are important. And even if you, know, and if you don't like, forget you. No, 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 we, we wanna talk, we're trying to figure out what it is that, once again, particularly younger media consumers want to hear about. Right. What do they want to be informed about? What do they want to crack jokes about? And then give it to them in a way that they can listen on their time. So, Michael, what does that mean for the future of talk radio? If I, if I listen to talk, uh, Dennis Prager today, mm-hmm. it's not on AM. It's in right. Stitcher. Right, of course. No, so, I mean, radio, well, radio has bigger problems. Than I, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm almost like reluctant to talk about it because... I made my living doing talk radio. Right. I love doing talk radio. I was a huge fan before I ever did a show. I was a listener. I, right. I fell into it backwards. I'd run campaigns and started being a guest, and then it was offered a show, and it took off from there. But radio has fundamental problems having to do with debt and an inability to match the cost of production to the marketability of production. You know, it costs them $100 to make $70 worth of radio, and you just can't you get around that. Mm-hmm. Then there's also the other problem, which is, and I'm loath to criticize people by name, but let's. <laughs> Sean Hannity is doing the same radio show he was doing 15 years ago. Yes, you can is. literally take the names and just replace them and just pull out the names. Actually, with Hillary running again, you didn't, you didn't even change the names. It was the same show. Same show. Nothing in TV. Everybody understands. You start a TV show, it's going to end. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, 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 Rob Long, our mutual acquaintance, mm-hmm. a superstar of Ricochet, Brilliant TV show, Cheers. Mm-hmm. But Cheers ended. Right. You know, it, as, as good as it is, you know, The Sopranos ended. And, uh, uh, Rob Long's new show, King of, of uh, what? Uh, it's the King of Queens starred Kevin James. Yeah, King, yeah that's, that's right. It's not King of Queens. Anyway, it's, sorry, Rob. I was trying to plug your show. I can't remember we can edit. the name of it. <laughs> Thank you. Or not. <laughs> but every, every show has an end. Talk radio has not figured that out. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got people who are saying, Daddy, that's the same show I was listening to when I was, you know, 12. Now right. I'm t- 32. It's the same. What the, why am I, would you listen to that? And so that's, I think that's one of the, the big things that has hurt talk radio. That and talk radio was never, well, I'll take it back. Before Rush Limbaugh, talk radio was not the medium of a political party. Mm-mm. It was the medium of the outsiders versus the insiders. The insiders ran the you know, editorial page at the New York Times. They picked the news stories at CBS, NBC, ABC, particularly before you know, the internet was widely available. Mm-hmm. Talk radio was the only place to go. The alternet. To have, yeah. it, it was, exactly, it was the alternate. It was the 
uh, you know, the, uh, the, the dark internet. It was the, all the alternative media. It was the dominant alternative media. And so it was enough just to show up and not be echoing, you know, the mainstream media. That was enough. Well, those days are over. It's not enough anymore. And the idea that, in, that the kind of the model that uh, Rush and Hannity and, and uh, Hugh Hewitt have, which is we're going to turn talk radio into an adjunct of the Republican Party, the same way that the mainstream media turned themselves into adjunct of the Democrat Party, was always, in my opinion, a mistake. People don't want, the listeners don't want to be, on, once again, on the team, rah, rah, my team's always right, their team's always wrong. They want to have the real conversation that they're having with their family, with their friends at work. I, when people ask me who, who want to get in talk radio, you know, what should the conversation be like? I always say, yeah, have you ever been in a bar or a diner and the people at the next table are having a conversation that's so interesting that you scoot your chair over to them to try to hear it? If you're having that conversation on the air, you will probably win. It has nothing to do with pro-Republican, pro-Ryan, pro-anybody. It has to do with that real, the pinheads might be right about, you know, uh, certain, you know, level, high level topics, you know, medical things and other things that require a lot of technical information, but they're still pinheads and they don't get how real people live. They don't understand that boys and girls are in fact different. They don't understand the basics of supply and demand that real people live by. They don't get that normal stuff, what I used to call my radio show, the natural truth. The things that are just true, that everyone knows are true, even if you know you're not supposed to say them. We all know they're true. That's why talk radio was invented. And uh, the farther it gets away from that, I think the less and less hope it has for a viable future. But there is a demand for content. There is a demand for that conversation. That bar conversation. Conversation right. is what people want. It's the, right. old, it's the oldest form of entertainment. And so podcasts where you are not restricted by the commercial, and you mm -hmm. can certainly, you know, certainly do segues, and, 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 and I know that content. you have, absolutely, but so it's it's having that conversation, and not an extreme level, and as you correctly stated, you know, Rush Limbaugh has been doing the same show for 28 years or whatever it is, and people get, and I grew up on that. I, sure. I cut my political teeth listen to mm -hmm. Rush Limbaugh at the beginning of the Clinton administration. But it's it's it hasn't evolved. Nope. And it's old. And mm -hmm. and half the well, more than half the people that we're here with on the Weekly Standard Cruise. Um, they are wonderful, gracious people, but there is a fact about talk radio that people who want to keep it alive need to understand. Polling done in twenty fifteen showed that a majority of people forty and under said they a majority said yeah. they will never ever listen to a radio station if they think that it's talk. If you if it's on the dial and they see, you know, as you right. know, country, whatever, that they simply will not push that button. That's the standing of the brand of talk radio. That's, by the way, the standing of the brand of the Republican Party for people 40 and under. And it's a real interesting question about what this win by Donald Trump means for that. Is this a reshuffling of the whole conversation where suddenly, you know, Talk radio's ratings are going to shoot up again and Republican politics are going to be popular again. Or was it the last gasp of the baby boomers, thanks to Hillary's unpopularity, thanks to Trump's unique popularity among baby boomers who were low motivation voters? He got them to come out in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and Michigan. If it's the latter, if it's a last gasp, then I go right back to all the people I love in talk radio and all the people I love in the conservative movement. And I say, okay, what are you going to do four years, eight years, 12 years from now as these voters pass on to mm -hmm. the end of the rain, train ride and millennials who are already the largest voting eligible block? They're all, if they all registered to vote, they would be the largest group of voters. What are you going to do? Is they, they're going to get bigger and bigger, comparatively right. speaking. What's your plan? And, and you're, going, and you're going where they live. And my plan, I, very simple, have fun and go where they are. They're not on AM radio. They're not sitting around watching hour-long documentaries about the fundamentals of the free market. You know, they have the, the Baroque music. You know, dur, 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 right. dur. Hi, we're three white guys. And we're sitting in this very dark room Econ and we're talk. talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what they are. They <laughs> right. want the information. They want to understand. They're not stupid. Well, right. okay, let's face it. Millennials are kind of stupid. But, but let's, they, let, they, they let's, gotta, let, let's open that to, to discuss real briefly here because it is important to discuss some of the content because at the end of the day, it is about issues. It mm -hmm. is about policy. And we just elected a candidate that, by by and large, the Weekly Standard, mm -hmm. including yourself, right. thought didn't have a chance. That's right. And if I could shift the conversation to the election real briefly here, and, and we you haven't discussed it jerk. all this week. <laughs> of course he has to. <laughs> yes, I was wrong. I admit it. I was wrong. I'm sorry, Mr. Trump. I'm sorry. 
So uh, one of the one of the biggest uh, and, and, and ricochet, which, you know, obviously tremendous conversation over the past 15 months. You have the never Trumpers, you have the Trump supporters, mm -hmm. you have the folks that are, are going back and forth regarding, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it, Supreme Court. And I, I mean, I, I said this on a podcast mm -hmm. several months ago. I, I'm a SCOTUS Trump guy. Right. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm never Hillary. Sure. I was nev not, and never Trump. I thought this, you know, the Supreme Court for me was 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 the biggest issue. Sure. So there's shades of gray. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the past few days here on the on the um, weekly Standard Cruise, uh, uh, Bill Crystal, Stephen Hayes, yourself, others um, have have discussed obviously looking forward with a positive attitude, mm -hmm. looking forward, saying, okay, he won, fantastic, success, Republicans own everything. All right, we're going to keep you know feet to the fire mm -hmm. and make sure that they they, they push the policies. Talk to me about what you would hope for as a conservative for him to pass in his first hundred days. Uh, the first thing, what would no, be the, the most important I, I, thing? People think I'm kidding. I mean this. The first thing that Trump should sign with his first pen, his first minute at the desk, is a pardon for Hillary Clinton. And I mean that sincerely. And I don't mean it because I'm trying to be nice or anything. Okay. I want Donald Trump to say, America, I am pardoning Hillary Clinton for the many, many crimes that she committed while Secretary of State. <laughs> Signs a pardon, and it just, it's that, and that's it. That's the whole statement. Because there's only one, this is what people don't get, there's only one kind of person who needs a pardon. A criminal. Right. If you're not a criminal, you don't need a pardon. Once he pardons her, she is forever convicted as a criminal. These idiots who want to, oh, we're going to go back and have hearings, and Jim Jordan's going to get her this time. No, he's not. Don't, don't distract us. This would be the most brilliant Trumpy thing ever. It would be for the Trump to pardon her for her many, many crimes. And then whenever someone brings it up, oh, I pardon her. What? No, no investigation. We're moving on. The Clintons have had their verdict. We're moving on. It would ruin. It would be the worst thing that ever happened to Hillary Clinton. It would be magnanimous. Cause, magnificent. Because what's she going to do? I don't need a pardon. I'm innocent. Okay, fine. Then we'll have an investigation. Here's my special prosecutor. We'll have all 30,000 deleted emails by Monday. Oh, uh, never mind. Wait, no, I'm sorry. She can't do it. This is, this is, this will be so Trumpy and so wonderful. <laughs> Please, Mr. Trump, do it. Pardon Hillary so that she'll be forever the person who was so guilty she needed a pardon. I like that. First of all, happens. that we got a new adjective, Trumpy. It's a great word. Oh, Trumpy. You, you're not using Trumpy? Everyone, I know she's using Trumpy. It's Absolutely. grown on me. Trumpy's good. I'm, I'm big, <laughs> big on Trumpy with the kids. I'm also big on this one. Yeah. What? Have you seen that that's like the thing now? The kids, my teenage kids. I've, what? I've, you say you say something that, you know, like Trump's going to win. What? This, that's the, I'm trying to get that into my my. You, you want to get that one too? I want. Uh, you not really pathetic. are going after. I'm the that youth. pathetic guy. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to quit. Hey, hello, fellow students. How are the youth today? Want to join me for listening to some of your Stitcher hip hop stuff? I I was snap chapping and my Instagram was all groovy. Kitties? That's, that's sadly, that is. That's my kids. That's me. That's sad. Uh, this other thing, policy-wise, yes. um, I think that uh, the American economy is essentially a, uh, you know, like a pit bull with a leash on that it's just so ready to go. Right. It is not the case that we need what Reagan did where you needed to inject, you know, money from both ends, you know, defense spending one way and then tax cuts the other way to kind of turn us around for the malaise. And also, to, uh, don't let me say I didn't say anything nice about Carter. Carter's a change at the Fed. They tightened mm -hmm. the money pop monetary Volcker. policy. Volcker was, that was key. And that created some short term problems and long term prosperity. But all, you know, we're not there. Right. We really aren't. If you, you don't need a trillion dollars in road spending, which, come on, we pass a stupid highway bill every three years. They're all $300 billion. You know, that's, that's, just forget that. Just take stuff off. Just just deregulate. You're just a free say, market guy, though. Yeah, Talk yeah. about carrier for a minute. I mean, there's a lot of controversy that's, about that. Okay. Is that is that cronyism? Of course is it is. It? Of course okay. it is. But wait, 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 wait. It's cronyism in my price range. And let me explain. It. <laughs> Look, I've been having a debate my whole life that goes like this. I don't want any tax deductions of any kind. Uh -huh. I want the lowest possible rate. I don't want any special deals of any kind. I don't. I just want everything. Just to, you know, I want to. I like the postcard tax, the tariff. Same thing. If right. you're going to have tariffs, I want it to be just like the lowest, just flat, boring. I, I, so I don't. I don't want politics to matter at all. But you know what? I've lost that fight. I lost that fight when W was in office. I lost that fight when Obama was in office. And I've obviously lost that fight with Donald Trump, who does not believe at all in the notion of an unfettered free market. He absolutely believes in picking winners and losers. And I think one of the reasons people voted for him was because they said, you know what? 
We had Solyndra, half a billion dollars, no jobs. Mm -hmm. Obama's buddy's got stuff. We, all this money they're throwing at green projects and at colleges, universities, you know, the stimulus, uh, the vast majority of the money went to government workers. The voters have figured it out. It's going to be pork. It's going to get sliced up like bacon, and it's going on somebody's plate. And the Trump voters said, screw this free market stuff. I'm shoving you out of the way and getting my plate. So, so why not have Trump? Is that in tax that cuts? Or? It's in care. In other words, you, you, if you use the example of carrier, if the deal that Trump makes is, look, I'm going to give you free marketers 80% of what you want, mm -hmm. and I'm going to serve it with a side dish of 20% of total hypocrisy, shameless interference in the market to service these voters so that they will back me so we can get the 80% of the free market. That is smart politics. Is it ideologically correct? No. Right. Is, will it hurt the economy? A little bit. But once again, we just went through Obama. Eight years of shameless cronyism, of shamelessly mm -hmm. picking winners and losers, of trying to wipe an entire section of the economy, energy, off the map. The Trump voters get it. The system is rigged because it's called politics. As soon as there's politics, everything's rigged. So I'm never going to have the ideological purity I want. I can live with modest, shameless hypocrisy. Last question for you. Got it. Um, we know all the reasons, the run-up to the election, why you had problems with Trump, why we yeah. all had problems with Trump. Okay. What is your biggest hope for Trump in the next four, maybe eight years? Uh, that he gets incredibly bored with the actual work of being president and decides to be cheerleader and let his cabinet leaders be leaders. That's my number one hope. And, and, I, and I think we could have an amazingly successful four to eight years for America, not for Republicans. I'm, 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 beyond, I'm, I'm willing to have the conversation too, but right. I really think because of it's been so awful, the 2000 election, I think it affected America more than people realize. This, you know, this kind of this tie that was unclear for and sure. selected, yeah. not elected. Yeah. And, you know, those idiots in Florida. I never forget watching on South Tries. What do you mean you don't know how to vote? I mean, I, I loved watching. You know what's funny, too, about Florida, Floridians, because they're all like 127 years old, is not only did they not know how to vote, they had no shame about it. They were running <laughs> to the camera. To, I couldn't figure out that ballot at all. I was in the voting booth. For, you can. I was there for 30 minutes. I couldn't find Dewey or Truman anywhere on that damn thing. What's going on? You know? And so I think that hurt us more than people realize. I think the 9-11 moment... Uh, uh, interjected a, a level of passion and focus on political events that didn't exist before. And then the Iraq war debate, it's just not because anyone was bad on either side. It just went in a way that left people feeling distrusted, trust, un, un, you know, distrustful. Then the Obama eight years of nonstop, <sighs> I'm President Obama. I just wish I had a better country to be in charge of. It's a shame that you've all let me down again, yet again. I am the best person ever in the world, and you're all just so awful. Mm -hmm. And eight years of that. We're not of, worthy of them. Exactly. Of just getting, you know, either you can't trust the people at the top, or they say they can't trust you. I really think that uh, it, it's been awful. It's really been a, 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 a not unique and unusual moment in American history. And if we can just have boring. That's why I was a Scott Walker guy from the beginning. I don't know Scott Walker or anything, but boring. I love Scott Walker. I love the idea of a guy who doesn't need to be president. Right. Who's just like, it's a job. You know what I'm saying? It's like, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a photographer. What do you do? Oh, I'm president. You know, he gets his little lunchbox out, you know, flips the lid open, takes out the thermos with this Campbell soup in it. You know, <laughs> what are we doing today? Vetoing a bill? Okay. You know, I want boring because I want government not to matter. And how shocking would it be if Trump's celebrity and reality TV style Right. Keeps the focus on the crap that I don't care about. And underneath this nice, Things boring shrinking of government, this nice, boring pulling back of regulations, of make, you know, not having a president shout, you're not letting that person use the right bathroom. You, know, you shouldn't have arrested that college professor on his way. That all goes away. Yeah. And, and, and real live politics in my life actually becomes far less important. If Donald Trump does that for me, I, will, I, I, I hope... I've been eating nonstop crow since November 8th. Right. I'm hoping to stay on the all crow Atkins diet until the end of the Trump presidency or until they pull him out from a mound of hookers and he has to leave in disgrace. One of the two, <laughs> I'll take either one. Gold leafed. Where can we find you, Michael? Uh, well, if you're my pro officer, I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> you can find me at theweeklystandard.com, at washingtonexaminer.com. And the easiest way is just go to michaelgram.com, takes you to my Facebook page, and there's always something funny. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Have appreciate a great it. rest of the cruise. Thank you. Thank you.